good afternoon, morning, night, depending on where everyone is. Um, it's really great to welcome everyone to this third webinar from our second international symposium um, on the application of AI in metallurgy and materials. Um, so my name's Jenny Shepherd. Um, I'm a lecturer um, at the University of Leicester within the School of Engineering and have been involved with the organisation of this um, series along with um, all of our organising um, committee and our um, chairs. Um, and so we've had previously had two very successful webinars um, that looked on the applications of AI in material science and engineering and also um, a bit more about alloy and process design. Um, but today's session really prom um, focuses on the data driven approach and its application to material science. Um, so if we can just go to the next slide. Yep. Um, Sorry, so if we can go to the slide about, um, it's a different version of the thing to I've seen. Yeah, um, so we're really lucky to have um, three internationally renowned speakers um, from literally all sides of the world. Um, but um, before we get on to the scientific talks, we're going to have an introduction from the University of Leicester's um, President and Vice Chancellor, um, Professor Nishan Kanagaj. Kanagaraja, um, who unfortunately wasn't able to attend this afternoon, but has um, given us a pre-recorded um, welcome to this seminar session. So, Shinapat, hopefully we can play this. Hi. On behalf of everyone at University of Leicester, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this conference in artificial intelligence in metallurgy and materials. Conferences are a key activity for research intensive universities. It allows us to bring together the greatest minds working in that area, to create new connections, to meet up with old connections, but more importantly, to share the latest development in your field and think about the future of this area. Artificial intelligence is revolutionizing many areas of our disciplines and society as a whole. And I'm sure during this conference you'll come up with new areas to investigate and new partnerships to help us solve some of the problems. I'm aware the last inaugural symposium was very successful in Beijing. And unfortunately, we have to have this event virtually. Nevertheless, I want to thank all those involved in organizing this symposium, and I hope you have a fantastic time. Go away with great memories of this virtual conference. All the best. Hi. Okay, um, so we now go on to the um, scientific talks. Um, so how this is gonna run is we'll have our three talks and then we'll have questions at the end during a, um, discussion session. So if any questions at all come up um, during the talks, if you could um, write them in the chat box um, with which of the panel, which of the presenters they are um, focused at, that would be really great. And we can then um, have a bit of a discussion and answer all of those questions at the end. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, which is um, Professor Dushan uh, Shua who um, from Xi'an Zhaotong University. Um, so Professor Xue um, received his BSc and PhD from Xi'an Zhaotong University, um, spending time during his PhD at the National Institute of Material Science, Scuba Japan. Um, he was then a postdoc at Los Alamos National Lab in the USA before he returned to Xi'an Zhaotong University in 2016. He's currently a professor of material science at the university and has published prolifically with a particular research interest in materials informatics. Um, and he's currently accelerating the search for new materials using machine learning and optimization algorithms. Um, and his talk today is entitled Active Learning in Searching for New Materials with Emphasis on Efficient Sampling Using Uncertainties. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to pass the floor over to Professor Shui. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. So I'm going to share my screen.
Okay, so yeah. uh, my, I'm Te Jun Xue from Xi'an Jiao Tong University. It's my great honor to have this opportunity to share our recent progress on the material informatics. Uh, my title today is Active Learning in Searching for New Materials with Emphasis on Efficient Sampling. So first, I would like to thank my collaborators, Dr. Ding, Professor Sun, and Professor Zhou in Xi'an Jiao Tong University, and also Trab and Prasanna from US. And uh, most of the work is actually did by my students. I have three postgraduate students, Ray Hao, Tian, and Yun Fan. And I also would like to thank the, those fundings for the financial support. So the, there is a big challenge, challenge in developing new material is that the, the search space of the new material is uh, very high dimensional and very complex. That's because there's many tuning knobs to control the the property of the material, such as the chemical compositions, the processing conditions, and also like the microstructures, faces, and crystal structures. So those complexity makes the the discovery space very high dimensional. So there are millions or hundreds of millions possibilities uh, for us to explore, but what we know is only a very small fraction of experimentally uh, data, experimental data. So the big challenge is how to from this small fraction of the data to explore, efficiently explore the huge uh, search space, the discovery space. Uh, that's we, what we think uh, the big challenge in the material science. So let's re define the, the, the searching for new material in this way. So we think the development of a new material is an optimization pro uh, problem in this very huge search space, which is consisted of uh, compositions, processing conditions, and extra. So we want to find a material, we want, want to find a material that have uh, the targeted properties Max, maximum. So if the if the if the space is very simple, only have one unique optimum or minimum. So it's very easy for us to find find this minimum. So we do a series of experiment, and we can easily find such kind of minimum. But actually, what we meet is we have uh, a lot of. Uh, 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 sub minimum and we we cannot directly get the global minimum so we need to do many many experiments to explore the whole space and find the the one with the best targeted property so we then can employ the machine learning or the statistical inference to predict to make predictions for those possibilities in such a large search space. So based on the existing data. So the machine learning help us to build the mapping or the functional form between the features, the X, such as the, all the material disc descriptors, such as the compositions or processing conditions to the Y, Y is the targeted property. So if we have such kind of functional form or the mapping, so we can, directly go to the global minimum. And those predictions allow us have a quick identification of the targeted, targeted material with the optimized compositions and processing conditions. So the traditional data-driven approach usually consists of uh, accumulating large amount of data and then, then build machine learning models on such kind of uh, large data and the statistical inference learn from the data and get the, the mapping, get the, the functional form. Then you use this, this kind of fu functional form y equals to fx to predict the unexplored space and then pro predict the properties of the search space. Based on the 
predictions. So one can select the, the one with the best prediction to do simulation or either do experimental synthesis or characterization. Once we get the experimental results or simulation results, then we feed the data back to the data space, database. So then we can do the, step, do the learning again. We're using such kind of iteration loop to, to, to drive the search for the new material. That's the traditional data-driven approach. But uh, you already met a small data problem in material science. So unlike the, the data sites in, in like in Google or in Marie, which have the petabyte or terabyte, those large data. So in material science, the, the data is quite small. It's over less than one gigabyte, or, or especially for the experiment list. Uh, I am myself is an experiment list. So for a particular uh, alloy system, we usually have like uh, tens of uh, samples or, or a hundred of uh, uh, data points. So that's all we have. So, so this is not a, especially in the experiment part, this is, this is not a big data problem. I think it's a small data problem. So due to such kind of small data problem, so the number of the samples or the number of the data is very limited. So based on such kind of small data, we, we, we make the statistical inference. The model is not necessarily optimal. We can, the, the prediction may not be good. So if we use such kind of uh, predictions with, with large uncertainties to guide the experiment, so we don't think the guidance will be good. So then such kind of a loop may not be efficient. So to this end, in order to overcome such kind of a small data problem, we proposed such kind of adaptive design loop to accelerate the search for new pr problem. So the, the green arrows shows the loop of the traditional data-driven approach or the, the big data-driven approach. So the blue one is the what we did. So we want to start from the database, uh, usually it's a small database, then we build a statistical uh, inference or machine learning models. These models are predictive, but the, the predictions can contain a lot large, large uncertainties. So based on the model predictions and, and uncertainties, we end a panel of adap adaptive experimental design. We use this panel to choose the most informative sample to get the, the, the value, the most valuable experiment and then use, then use this experiment design part panel to guide the next calculation or next experimental characterization and then feed these back to the database and do the loop again again. So the, the, key in the, uh, the, the key here is we introduce the optimal experimental design, design component, which will efficiently sample the most informative experiment. So that's, that is the, the approach we are going to use. So in order, in order to demonstrate such kind of a loop, it's very efficient in, in searching for new material, we first want to show a, a simulated case, very simple two-dimensional case to, sh to show our idea. So here, suppose we want to maximize the y, the y-axis by varying the x. We can consider x as the, like the aluminum contents in the titanium alloy. So the question is how to find the, the best x to maximize the y. So if we know the actual distribution of y with x, it's quite easy. Right? If we know y equals to fx, 
then we know the red dot curves. It's quite easy. We find the we believe the red curve and we find the x optimized, which correspond to the y max. So that's the best material we are going to find. But the reality is we don't know the functional form. We don't know the red curve. So how to find the best x to maximize y? So we can we can employ the machine learning algorithms. So there are many algorithms uh, can be explore, uh, employed to estimate the curve. So we here we refer to such kind of model as a regressor. Actually, it's a regression model. So the the most simplest the simplest one regression model is the linear model. So we fit the three data with a linear model. And the, the, the green line is the linear model and the points in the green line is the prediction of the Y. So we can, which one is going to do for the next experiment, we choose the one with the highest prediction. So we refer to this argmax Y as the selector. So we select the, the material with the highest predicted value. So then we do the experiment, but uh, the result is not good, right? As the red dot shows. But the good thing is we have four data points and we update our linear model. We update the, the parameters in our linear model and then we have new predictions. Then we use the selector to select the next experiment point, the star shows the next experiment. We do the experiment. The results are not good, but we have five data point, points. So what we did is we start from the data and we do the regress, the, we do the statistical inference. And then based on the best prediction, we do the new experiment and we feedback. Then we do this loop again and again and until we find the highest Y. So actually such kind of a loop it's a big data loop. It's not very efficient if we have very small amount of data to start with. So we almost tried all the possibilities to find the maximum value. So we, we do the like more than 90% experiment to find the best, best material. So one way, is, one way to improve the efficiency is to find a better regressor. For example, here we try the polynomial model, we make it a little bit nonlinear. So again, we do the experiment again, again, to do the loop again, again. So we almost try all the possibilities. And we tried even more experiments than the linear model. And uh, this is not very good. So we can put our domain knowledge. We, we have the physical models or the, in, empirical models, which help us to, to find a better estimation of the, the real function. So we give, the, we give a very nonlinear model with multiple uh, maxima. So it's very close to the real distribution. And at this time we do the loop again, again, and we only try half, the pos half of the possibilities. So as we, as we said that we, in reality, we have millions of possibilities. So if we try half, this is far beyond our capabilities to do experiment or even calculations. So then we put our experiment design panel into this loop. So we from data to do the regression, we build the statistical inference. With this inference, we can have the predictions the most important thing is here, we must incorporate the uncertainties. So using this design panel, we select the next experiment. It's not necessary to be the best prediction. It can be another point, but more in helpful to build a better model. So again, we start from the linear regression model, but we use another selector. So what we call it the efficient global optimization. So we have the regressor as the linear regression model and the selector 
is the ego, efficient global optimization. So you will see here, so we, we are not going to choose the best predicted value. We choose another point, which is more helpful to the model. So we tried a quarter of uh, the possibilities. It's, uh, it's faster. So we can also combine the polynomial model with the selector. We, we now do the 16 new experiment to find the best value. And if we combine all the panels together, we put our domain knowledge to, to make the statistical inference better and better. And then we put the adaptive design panel, adaptive design, design panel to help us to make decision. Then we can have a very good results. So the, the optimization process was accelerated. We only need six, six new data, new experiment. We just need six new, oh, sorry. Okay, I want to just show this video again. So we just need six new experiment to find the maximum. So we say that the informatics may accelerate the discovery of new materials. Okay, in the, in the following, I'm going to show two case studies, which we use the sort of kind of adaptive design loop to actually find some new material or the material with better properties. So the case study one, what I call is the selecting the selectors. Um, I want to show which selector so far is the best for the, the material science, especially the experiments in material science. So we have the data, usually it's very small, and we build the statistical inference. We can have many different uh, models, we can have linear models, we can have kernel-based models, we can have tree-based models, and we can also have the, like the neural network or deep learning. Then this kind of statistical inference can, it's predictive, it can be applied to the unexplored candidates and give the predictions of those candidates. So here, the unexplored possible candidates is very, the number is very large. So with this predictive model, plus this uh, unexplored space, we could have thousands of, uh, or tens of thousands of candidates with predicted property. So next question is, which, which candidates should we do experimentally? You know, in experiment, we cannot do so many at a time. So consider the cost. So we may only make one or two alloys. So the question is how to select the candidates from, for the next experiment. So that's the, that's the select data. So what the select data is help us to make decision, which experiment to do. There's many different kinds of selectors. Many, usually it can be divided into such kind of uh, four categories. The first one is try and error, which is we, we do it randomly and the second one is exploitation and the third one is exploration. And the last one is the balance trade-off between the two. Okay, let me explain it one by one. So exploitation is uh, what we believe the, is we are going to believe the machine learning model or the statistical, statistical model. So look at the picture. So the blue points are the, are the experimental data are the real data. And then we build a machine learning model to give the prediction for the rest points. So the red line is the machine learning model. So exploitation means that we believe in the model. We think the model is 100% correct. So if we think the model is correct, then we believe it, we will choose the one with the highest predicted value to, to do the experiment. That's exploration, I, 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 sorry, exploitation. And that's the one extreme end. So we go into the other extreme end. So we, again, we have five blue points, which are the, which are the real data. And the red curve is a, pretty, is a machine learning model. And then the green curves are all possible machine learning models, or we can consider the, that's a 
the uncertainty of the machine learning model. So we are the 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 gray curve span a lot means the machine learning model have a lot of uncertainty. So here we want to end more points and points to improve the machine learning model. So we want to choose the one with largest uncertainty to help us to improve the model. That's exploration. But in reality, we don't know our model is, is perfect or our model is uh, totally bad. So we need some balance trade-off between the exploitation and exploration. So here, this, this figure it just shows some show some uh, selectors. So see the new there are one, two, three, four new samples. The bar the height of the bar is a predicted property. So if we follow the best prediction explore, exploitation, we will choose number number four sample. But uh, the the prediction may not be so good. It contains some uncertainties. So the the normal distribution above it is the uncertainty. So the blue horizontal line is so far the best performance. So if we integrate the shaded area, that is the possibilities to improve the property, to get a better property if we do the experiment. For example, if we integrate the, the shaded area for sample three. So that is the possibility to improve the material, improve the property if we did, if we did number three sample. So this is the possibility. If we times the possibility with the improvement and then we calculate the expected expectation, then we can have the expected improvement. This expected improvement is related to the uncertainty and also related to the predicted value. So using this, this expected improvement, we can balance trade-off the exploitation and exploration. So by the balance trade-off exploitation and exploration, so the next, next uh, experiment is not the one with highest predicted value and it's not the, the one with highest uncertainty. It, it choose the one as the dotted vertical uh, uh, vertical line shows. So this one can, this is the different selectors. So we use a model system of Behrman titanate based ferrics to ferroelectrics to benchmark our approach. So the targeted property here is the electro string. So we, this kind of material can have string if we apply the electric field. So we want the string as high as possible so that we can make the device smaller. So the data in the search space is, we have uh, 61 known data. So this 61 data we have uh, real, we have real properties. We build the model on these 61 data points and to search for the the new material in these half million possibilities. So we use the side camera design loop and we use different selectors to choose different experiment. And we see which selector choose the best material. And we build the machine learning model and we do the feature selection, we do the model selection and we find the SVRBF is the best model. And it can give us the prediction. And here is the results. So Please see the the left hand panel. So we plot the measured string as a function of uh, iteration loops. So one means the first iteration, two means the second iteration, and the one the points in different color means we select them from different selectors. It can be seen that the balance trade off selector will give rise the best results. So within only five, uh, only three iterations, we do three more experiments, we can improve the electro stream by 53% compared to the largest one in, in the string. 
So this is very efficient. So using such kind of selector to help the machine learning model, we can very quickly to find the best material. And we explain our results by the DFT and, and both face field simulations. So we would like to say that the balance trade-off between exploration using uncertainty and the exploitation using the model predictions is a good optimal criterion for guiding the experiments in material design. So here's a case study two, which is uh, actually the alloys and night, night, night high ship memory alloys. So this is the ship memory alloys. What we care about is the thermal hysteresis. You know, there is a phase transition in such kind of material. So we want the, the heating transition and the cooling transition occurs at one temperature. So the search space is very large and the known data is very small. We have 22 known data, but we only, we almost have uh, 0.8 million possibilities. So we use in such kind of design loop to find the best one, best material. So here, this figure shows our practice is using our training data to find the best regressor and selected combinations. You know, there are so many combinations we use our training data to, to pre-select the best one, regress and select a combination. And again, only use six iterations. We find the lowest ship memory alloys, some of its risks, I mean. So this is our new, the, the, this our new design new alloys and compared to the commercial night F50, it's the some of its risks are is greatly reduced and we have a better thermal stability and the temperature, the, the shift of the transition temperature is very small, it's 0 0.02 Kelvin. And so let's go to the final conclusion. So our work provide a framework for accelerate the discovery of, uh, of new material, especially from experiments with small data sets. And we use uncertainties in the measurements or the model predictions to guide the next experiment. And we can have the budget or cost considerations. And our cost uh, folks here is uh, iteratively refine the predictions to minimize, to minimize the number of new experiments or calculations we need. So that's the consideration of uh, design and uncertainty uh, efficient sampling. So that's all for my talk. Thank you, thank you very much. I hope I have, a, I do not spend too much time. No, thank you very much. That was um, excellent. Uh, Shinapak, could you quickly go back to the outline slide, the schedule? Thank you. So um, thank you very much for that um, really informative talk, um, Professor Shue. Um, so next, I'm really pleased to invite um, Dr. Enzo Liotti um, from the University of Lecture, uh, sorry, from the University of Oxford um, to give his talk. Um, so Dr. Liotti's um, background in, in, is in materials engineering with um, undergraduate degrees from the Politecnico di Milano um, and a PhD from the University of Loughborough. Um, he joined um, Patrick Grant's group at the um, University of Oxford in 2011 um, and he has a real focus on in situ imaging um, of solidification um, with particular research interests in X ray synchrotron techniques. Um, and so his talk today um, it's on the study of nucleation in aluminium alloys using X ray, radio X -ray radiography um, and machine learning. So I'm delighted to hand over to Dr. Liotti. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, can you see the presentation? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 
So thank you very much for the very thorough introduction. And uh, first of all, I would like to acknowledge, uh, sorry, to thanks the organizer for this webinar for the invitation. Um, in this presentation, I'm going to talk a bit about, as uh, says the title, about uh, a bit of the work we have been doing at Oxford in studying nucleation of aluminium alloy using in situ X-ray imaging, and in particular. Um, of the use of machine learning that France has been fundamental for extract essentially quantitative information out of the data we have been collecting along the years in uh, that would have been otherwise uh, unobtainable. So the work I'm presenting uh, has been done uh, through uh, using a, a grant from the APSRC which is one of the council that fund uh, research in the in the UK and it's called Future, Line, uh, Future Liquid Metal Engineering Hub and uh, is a big uh, multi-collaborative um, project which involved five universities in the UK, Brunel University, which is the leading on this project, and then the University of Leeds, Oxford, Manchester, and Imperial College. The work I'm presenting today has been done with like uh, my colleagues in Oxford, so Professor Patrick Grant, who is the leader of, of, the, of the group, uh, Andrew Lou and Robin Vincent, and then uh, Carlos Arteta and uh, Andrew Zisserman at the uh, Department of Oxford Engineering who developed uh, the, the machine learning algorithm. And Alexander Rack, which is uh, a Beamline scientist at ID19, Beamline at the SRF. So a uh, little bit of introduction about why we study solidification. Uh, well, if solidification science underpinned many of the um, of critical sector in the in the in the metal industry, and in particular, if you look at the metal processing chain, uh, solidification is the first step. In fact, pretty much any metal component has gone through like the liquid to solid transformation at some point, either by casting or gas atomization. Therefore, the microstructure that are developed during the solidification steps have a very strong influence on the final product properties. And uh, what we are aiming to, and why that's the reason why we study nuclear solidification, is to basically learn how to manipulate this microstructure to be as good as possible in the first step. In particular, if we look at the casting and aluminium alloy, if you do try to cast something, uh, probably what you obtain is exactly what you see in the image, uh, something that is a columnar coarse microstructure, right? That's the typical, and uh, let's say, call it natural microstructure you obtain when you cast something. But what you would like to obtain is a grain refined microstructure. So that means like where equiax find an isotropic grain form instead of this columnar dendrite. Uh, the two, I mean, these retain many advantages uh, towards the, uh, compared to the columnar one is, you know, mechanical property are better, you get lesser defect and so on, uh, less macro segregation. For aluminum, the most used uh, methods to obtain an equiax microstructure is to inoculate. Inoculating means that you add uh, micron-sized particles, extrinsic micron-sized particles, so they don't dissolve in, in the liquid metal, that act as a nuclei uh, and form uh, and enhance basically heterogeneous nucleation. Uh, this technique is widely used in the aluminum industry, and uh, there is one particular uh, uh, particle which is called uh, uh, titanium diboride, which is uh, ubiquitous use for aluminum. Uh, however, the process is very inefficient. I mean, uh, only 1% of the seeds are added in nucleates, and this is actually has been already optimized along decades. Uh, and also the technique or the inoculation, it works for the primary grains, but it doesn't work for the secondary phase, like the intermetallic phase. So any improvement in the efficiency, uh, even passing, even increasing the efficiency from one to 2% or, or to find a grain refiner for intermetallic phase would actually have a very strong uh, effect on the improving the material and component properties. Traditionally, Metallurgy or metallurgical studies in general, but uh, study of nucleation uh, in particular, been done post mortem. So um, there is quite a, a long history uh, for the research in this in this uh, field. But uh, it's all done by microscopy or chemical analysis of uh, post mortem samples. So you prepare ten sample uh, with different condition, and then you cut them up and you look with a microscope. However, in the last uh, since the early 2000s, late 90s, with the advent of what is called third generation synchrotron, uh, like uh, for example, ESRF or, um, or uh, APS or, 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 or uh, uh, Spring 8 in, in Japan, uh, in situ imaging technique, 
such as like X-ray radiography and X-ray tomography, uh, reach uh, enough uh, spatiotemporal resolution to be able to capture the dynamic of solidification. And for a phenomena like, uh, like solidification, this is very important because uh, looking at the dynamic of the grain formation and grow and nucleation allow you to basically start to study the underlying physics phenomena that take place and therefore learn how to manipulate nucleation to obtain like microstructural tuning or like control of microstructure. A typical imaging experiment in radiography, so uh, an X-ray radiography is essentially um, it's not much different than when you go to, to the hospital and you get a radiograph. So in the setup uh, designed for uh, uh, solidification, we normally use uh, what is called a Brid Bridgman furnace, or essentially there, are, there is a furnace with two small plate heater, like you can see here, that are aligned vertically and they have a gap in the middle. <coughs> and um, the sample is positioned touching the two surfaces and, uh, and they can actually move up and down in certain uh, condition and then the x-ray passed through the middle in the gap and the transmitted x-ray passing through the sample are collected by uh, an optical system and transformed the x-ray into visible light and then collected by a camera. Uh, in this setting uh, which is very simple and that's why it's very useful uh, samples tend to be foil samples so the thickness vary but it's normally around 200 micron and this is actually to maintain basically a single layer of, of, of grains or crystal forming and not overlapping. Um, so if you do it well, then you can, let, you can collect images or videos and they obtain some, some kind of data. Yeah. Um, so this is a, another detail of how the furnace look like when it's set it up. This is the one we use for the data I'm going to present. And the setup is actually a DSRF in one of the beam line. You can see or recognize the two heater, one here and one here in the sample. And in this case, the arrangement was horizontal um, because we wanted to control uh, the, the thermal gradient uh, as accurate as possible and avoid uh, what is called like a thermosolutal combustion. Okay, so I'm gonna show a uh, first set of data. Uh, you can see here there are three videos ready to start. And uh, they are an aluminum 20% copper sample, which was added with this uh, magic powder, the grain refiner, right? In uh, the heater, we're essentially on, on the left and on the right. As you see before, the sample was positioned horizontal and the, what we call near isothermal condition. So near because it's essentially, there is always a little bit of thermal gradient. And what, the difference between the three videos is the cooling rate. So if I start the video, you will start to see uh, the grain forming, like these are actually small aluminum dendrites forming from the liquid. This is initially liquid. And of course, because we are cooling at three different cooling rate, the time uh, or the evolution of the solid fraction is different. However, even by eye, you can qualitatively see that the, the grain size on the right is much smaller than the one on the left. And that's because, uh, two reasons, because of grow and because of the nucleation is more copious, right? Uh, this actually is the effect or a known effect of what happens when you, when you cool faster. Normally you, you obtain a much finer microstructure because you nucleate or you enhance nucleation. Uh, in a similar comparison, these show the effect instead of like the, the solute content, so different alloys. So when you actually increase the content of the solute element, in this case from a 10% copper to a 25% copper, and these were cool, these four samples were cool at the same cooling rate which was 0 0.7 uh, Kelvin a second. And again, there is a lot of variability, as you can see, I mean, the color depend only, but this was kind of almost raw data, so that's why the color is different, but you can see the morphology, these are quite large and uh, form quite quickly, despite the cooling rate is the same in all of them. These tend to be kind of um, smaller and more equiax. And generally, uh, there are a lot of detail that can be picked by, by eye, and they are very important to understand the, the underlying mechanism of nucleation. However, uh, the difficult is how to extract this information. So uh, to give you an idea, in, in the years we've done on this specific experiment, more or less 55 days of bin time, during which we have collected more than 1,400 video sequences, which account for about 50 terabytes or, or more than 10 million images. 
cover a wide range of solidification condition, uh, change different alloy, and even use uh, a little electromagnetic steer to move the liquid and steer. Um, however, these are very beautiful data. The point is, uh, what do you do with, with them, right? So you got a lot of information contained in this, uh, in this data set, but the problem is extracting them. So for example, things that could be interesting from a point of view of nucleation, it starts to count the grain and estimate the formation rate. Uh, and also interesting information could be quanti quantify the grain grow rate, uh, either individual grains or, or the overall kind of grow and the measure solids field in the liquid uh, from this specific setup, information can be obtained of, of the uh, composition of the liquid uh, nearby the grains. And, uh, and also fluid and grain flow can be, could be done if, we could, if, the, if the grain could be tracked. And then with all these, information, uh, nucleation and growth theories uh, could be tested and, 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 and verified. And bear in mind that solidification science is a field in which there are many and long-standing theories. The problem is there is no experimental data uh, to validate them or, di or disprove them. Uh, so even for the task of counting, uh, it's something that could be done by hand, but that would mean if we're speaking about even 100 videos that somebody would have to go every single frame and then start to put dots uh, to count the, the, the grains and then go in the next frame and do the same. So that would be, uh, you know, a few maybe hundreds or thousand frames per experiment per 100 uh, times. That maybe can, you know, it's time consuming that could be done. However, when we start to look at quantification of grain growth, so if we want to actually learn about the growth of each individual grains, or measure basically what is called nucleation under cooling and that require measurement of, of the solid field that became unfeasible for, uh, manually by, by a human, right? Therefore, uh, in collaboration with, uh, with the Professor Andrew Zisserman group at uh, Oxford Robotic, uh, we developed a machine learning algorithm and the peculiarity was that uh, it required a minimum amount of training. So uh, out of the thousand videos, we used only um, six of them to which I had to manually count and put the dots uh, on the left. Uh, the algorithm was then learning from that and detecting the grain in new videos. And we used that essentially this, with six um, training set, we analyzed so far 128 experiments. And the algorithm was outputting a map allocation of the, of the grain to which then we added a second part of the algorithm and was tracking the grain and doing the, let's say solidification parameter measurement. So uh, giving output of the formation rate, grain size, grain growth, what we call nucleation under cooling, and then other things like the diffusion length, uh, which are measurement of, of the of diffusivity and grain movement. And this is an example. So that's the algorithm um, tracking the grain, detect them when they form, and then uh, the bounding box is actually giving you an idea of the size, although the contour and also the primary and secondary arm is generally track. The arrows give you an idea of the velocity. Uh, so this is quite rich information that can be extracted that, uh, um, honestly, that this cannot be done by hand. Uh, maybe the counting, yes, but uh, tracking 4,000 of thousands of grain, the, gra the grow is, is unrealistic. Uh, one use of this data is summarizing this table, which uh, account for 14,000 nucleation events. So this is the, the kind of number, right? So uh, bear in mind that in solidification, as, as the presentation before, experiments are quite difficult. So collecting data is not so straightforward. So being able to record hundreds or thousands of video and then manage to extract 14,000 points is, 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 is a great thing. So also because then you can start to look at correlation between uh, various parameters and actually look at the at the phenomena in a statistical, from a statistical point of view. For example, these graphs show that the, the formation rate, so the, the, the rate at which crystal form, uh, increase with the, with the cooling rate, and that's actually expected and known. But also, it's, there is a correlation between the cooling rate and, and the solid content. So, um, they, 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 strictly speaking, the, the formation rate increase with the cooling rate and the, and the solid content. But the two are correlated. For example, increasing the solid content as an effect only when you increase the cooling rate. A low cooling rate, essentially, it doesn't have an effect. This is a new finding that was found, uh, thanks to actually the very large amount of data that can be generated. 
A second very important measurement that we were able to do is what is called measure for each individual grain, the nucleation under cooling. The nucleation under cooling essentially is, the, the, is, is effectively the driving force that is necessary for a grain to form. So these nuclei sit already in the liquid above the melting point. When the nuclei, when the temperature of the, of the, of the liquid is decreased below the melting point, uh, there is still some energy body that needs to be overtake for these nuclei to form a, a grain. And this is very important to understand how nucleation works and how it can be improved. So the algorithm was uh, finding, for example, if we take this little uh, square here, was actually detecting the, 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 these, these five grains and then going backwards in time and essentially trying to, to search the first frame to in which in that specific location where the grain formed, uh, the grain was not yet formed. And then by measuring the solute concentration at that specific point, this, this value called under cooling could be measured. And by doing this, the algorithm was able to detect and measure 6,200 uh, nucleation event. And again, this is the first time that in, in metallurgy, we can measure nucleation and cooling directly for its individual grains and not as an overall uh, uh, value. Um, again, very interesting uh, results, uh, correlated like before as a function of the, of the cooling rate and then the solute content. And the behavior is, is in, a, in a certain way, is expected. Uh, under cooling are very small, as is known from theory. And so that's a confirmation of uh, many of the theory. But interestingly, for example, uh, the, the, these actually under cooling curves uh, dec essentially uh, decrease with increasing the cooling rate. This is actually uh, not what is believed in the normal uh, <clears throat> In, in, uh, in normal believing in the sense that normally it's believed that the effect of cooling rate is that uh, it increased the amount of undercooling and therefore you get more nucleation. What we actually show with this data is, is the opposite. You increase the undercooling and nucleation happen at lower, sorry, you increase the cooling rate and nucleation happen at lower undercooling. And um, it will be clear later uh, why. Um, finally, another insight we found is that uh, by analyzing the crystal formation rate, uh, we found uh, or confirmed that nucleation happened in bursts and is not a continuous uh, phenomenon. This again has been predicted in theory, but these data are the first experimental evidence. As you see here in the graph, is plotting the real time crystal formation. There was a first wave, and then there will be a second wave in a minute in which the, the, the crystal form all in burst essentially, right? So, and they don't actually form continually. So now there is a moment of in which there is low nucleation and then there is a third burst. Again, applying this methodology to all the 128 data, we found that these waves or burst are, uh, are correlated to the solute content, both in intensity and in frequency. Therefore, increasing the, the, the solute, what essentially has the effect is to increase the intensity and the frequency of this burst and therefore increasing the number of grain forming. So, um, essentially decreasing the grain size. And also we develop our own model or our own like, um, um, like empirical model to basically describe the effect of cooling rate and, uh, and the effect of, of this of solute uh, like uh, in terms of nucleation. So I arrived to my conclusion, like um, in my field in solidification, accurate imaging allow you to, to basically cuts the dynamic of the phenomena and actually start to look at the underlying physics. And it has become an indispensable uh, tool uh, for the study solidification. Um, it needs, oh, well, it's, uh, I, I'm a strong believer that uh, automated data analysis, in particular machine learning, are, are a tool that is necessary nowadays to exploit uh, this large data set and extract all the, all the, all the information and also to find new insight uh, for the strength that actually machine learning can look at data uh, in several uh, and find correlation and actually analyze thousands of thousands of data. And I think and going on, at least in the field of uh, X-ray imaging, machine learning and AI will become an indispensable tool as we're going faster and, and larger. So uh, with this, I conclude and I talk.
thank you very much for that um, fascinating talk and showing just how beautiful solidification can be. Um, so it gives me great yeah. pleasure. Yes. To... Um, Jenny, I just want to, to, to say something that, I mean, if yes. you have any question, please, please, please leave it in the, the chat box and then we will pick up in the panel discussion up after this, this, uh, this the keynote talk. So please feel free to, to feel the, I mean, to type your question and probably indicate the, the speaker who you want to address your, your question as well. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Thank you very much for that, Shinapat. Um, so yeah, it gives me great pleasure to announce our final um, speaker, which is Dr. Victor Castillo from um, the Computational Engineering Division at Lawrence Livermore National Lab um, in California. Um, so uh, Victor's got a over 30 years experience in industry and government research within um, computational physics, machine learning and basically anything to do with computers. Um, and I think the thing I liked most from his bio was the fact that he was also honoured with the 2013 Community Service Award from Great Minds in STEM. Um, and so, yeah, it gives me great pleasure to, now, uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Victor Castillo with his um, talk on faster prediction with AI. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers. Uh, and, uh, um, and hello from California, from uh, sunny, smoky California. So uh, I'll share my, my screen. And there we go. So uh, today I'm going to speak about using machine learning along with simulations. So what, what I'm doing in uh, the bottom line is doing a lot of um, very uh, high, high performance uh, computer simulations and using that as data uh, for machine learning algorithms. Uh, this is very advantageous to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, industry, and uh, I'll talk about some of the uh, uh, projects that we're doing. So the U.S. Department of Energy uh, is, provides a lot of funding for uh, our national labs to help um, uh, the uh, U.S. industries. And uh, the, the main reason is that uh, these industries use about 25% of the U.S. Uh, domestic uh, um, uh, energy, uh, the national energy. And so it's such a, a big cost to the, uh, to the manufacturers and additionally it's uh, 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 generating a lot of greenhouse gases. So we put a lot of effort into helping them optimize their systems through simulation and machine learning. <clears throat> um, so what industry needs, uh, the manufacturing industry needs that we, we find, find is rapid prediction. They want to be able to do their prediction very fast and they use simulation often for this, but we are um, able to uh, improve on that. Uh, they need to integrate their production data with their simulation output. If they do have simulation output, uh, often they do have a lot of data from, the, uh, uh, from instrumenting their, their, uh, their processing we can actually combine those together in a, in a good way, uh, in an in a, uh, uh, informed way. And also we need to inform their decision making. Uh, uh, often uh, they, they have uh, uh, decisions about uh, uh, whether they should do, uh, put in more sensors, uh, uh, run more simulations, or do more experiments. So we can actually help them quite, quite a bit in that uh, 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 making those capital decisions. And so I'm going to give a couple examples. The first example is from the glass manufacturing uh, industry. Uh, this is, uh, um, uh, so if you notice on the right, there's a picture of me and a couple of uh, summer students. Uh, we're in front of a, uh, a glass furnace. Now this glass furnace is about the size of a small house, a ranch, what we call a ranch style house. And uh, there's a little port there. Uh, you can actually go up and look into there and actually see the molten glass uh, where the glass is being melted. Uh, or the, the raw materials are being melted and forming the, the, the uh, uh, molten glass. Um, you can actually approach the window and, and look through a, a, a welder's glass to actually see it. Um, this is a cartoon that um, shows, um, this is a cartoon that shows how this, uh, uh, the glass uh, is processed in this tank. So up in the upper right-hand corner, left-hand corner, you have the raw materials uh, coming in. 
and they they move in through the uh, they they sink sink in, and the idea is you need they need to stir this up, and you cannot put an impeller in there because it's just it's molten glass, it's just too hot. So they need to figure out a way to mix the uh, mix the material. So they can um, the industry has come up with a clever way of putting these burners up at uh, up at the top, and uh, the radi the the heat moves through the glass. Uh, and is reflected off of this, uh, um, off the bottom, off this reflective material at the bottom, this refractory brick. Uh, what this causes is an outgassing of the, uh, of the, of the uh, raw material. This, the outgassing causes a, uh, a buoyancy, and this buoyancy uh, causes a, a, a convective, uh, these convective loops. These, uh, these convective loops are actually producing the, the mechanical agitation and stirring necessary for the uh, uh, for the product to mix properly. Uh, so it's all about adjusting the, the heat uh, distribution at the top along with a, a few other mechanical uh, uh, um, uh, assistance uh, like gates and uh, other um, uh, other ways of uh, mitigating the flow. This causes the proper mixing in, in the glass tank. Um, one thing that you get is a um, um, some of the problems is what, with the outgassing, you can actually get, get uh, the bubbles coming to the top and the foam uh, uh, rising to the top and, 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 and uh, moving towards the forming. And so what, what, they, what they're trying to do is get the foam moving to the left so that it subducts and uh, uh, it, it subducts and uh, is uh, 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 dissolved into the into the molten glass. Another uh, problem is if the the convection is too too vigorous, it will actually cause the uh, uh, raw materials to go out toward the forming, and th then you have un say uncooked raw material. And so they need they're constantly having to adjust the uh, the gas burners to uh, to mitigate these uh, these de uh, these defects these uh, production flaws. And so what I'm showing here is a, um, uh, a simulation that um, uh, uh, um, the simulation that we're actually um, uh, or the uh, the GUI that we have derived, and this is uh, the the finished product for us. What we've provided to the uh, uh, to the user, and we take we've taken a lot of simulations, and we've uh, 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 trained a, a machine learning neural net, and then I will. Um, I will demonstrate that um, here. So right now I'm showing the, uh, uh, the, the, um, the actual GUI and uh, this is uh, um, this obfuscated. It doesn't actually have the real data uh, to protect their IP. But if you notice that I can make an adjustments in real time. I can make these adjustments like what happens if I change these uh, uh, gas port distributions. And you'll see in about, about 10 seconds we get the new uh, velocity distributions and temperature distributions within that tank. These are the, these are based on the simulation predictions, and then additionally, after they run the simulations, the CFD, they they run uh, thousands of tracers through there, and these tracers mimic the flow of the the path of the the raw materials. From that, they can actually get these post processed uh, calculations. That what you know based on the distribution of what these particles are seeing, what kind of heat flows they're seeing, are they being overcooked or undercooked? And then they produce these uh, post-processing processing indices that are the, uh, the, the simulation uh, uh, predictions of the uh, quality, the, the quality indices. And we can actually match that up with production plant flaw data, and I'll show that in, in a second. And so if I go back to... Another example is from the aluminum in industry. So I, I thank uh, uh, Professor, Professor Lieta for, uh, Lieta for um, showing about uh, aluminum. This is actually a casting of a, a much larger bar uh, uh, ingot. These uh, ingots are um, uh, in production are about five foot across, about 60 inches. Uh, what you see on the uh, lower right hand corner are these uh, pilot plant scale uh, ingots that are done for experimentation. And then you see uh, myself and uh, my collaborator from Oak Ridge National Lab um, uh, uh, visiting the plant. And we, uh, and, uh, we, we ran simulations, uh, and I'll show the, the, the output of the simulation. Uh, this movie shows um, 
the actual simulations that we ran in a, in a commercial uh, software called uh, Procast. And what we're showing is over time, um, the ingot is, is, uh, is forming, there's a solidification, and when it solidifies, there's actually some uh, 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 residual stress baked into the ingot. And if that, uh, if that uh, uh, maybe I should go back to show you in the beginning here. Yeah, it, with the res residual stress, um, once the ingot uh, solidifies, you can get these cracks forming. And th this is actually a very uh, uh, big problem for the, for the industry in that, that that end would have to be cut off, that material would have to be reworked, and then they would have this inconsistent sized ingot for, for rolling because they can't send this, this ingot as is into the, ro uh, into the rolling process um, uh, with, that, with that crack. Additionally, there could be cracks on the surface and, and that would actually have to be manually machined off. So this could be very labor intensive. Um, so this uh, uh, preventing these cracks, preventing the, the resi residual stress is actually part of the project. Uh, so what we can do is simulate where the, uh, the uh, residual stress is and, uh, and, and predict it. Uh, the, these simulations here uh, take about uh, 24 hours actually to run, 24 to 36 hours. Uh, what we're doing is we're learning the simulations and the output of the, of the uh, fast running surrogate model, like the one for the glass, can actually uh, predict the, uh, the output in seconds. And so what I'm showing here on the left is um, a, a case where there's no cracking, there's no residual stress. And uh, we actually have a distribution of the hot tearing indicator, <clears throat> which is a, a measure of re residual stress. And it, it, the, the, the distribution shows a very low, uh, uh, low average for the hot tearing indicator. Uh, in in the, uh, the right hand side, we have a a case where there's a lot of residual stressing and likely to have cracking. And you can see the distribution is much, much, uh, much higher uh, for, the, uh, um, hot, uh, for the residual stress. So our approach is uh, what we refer to as scientific machine learning. We are using the physical simulations for the training. Uh, we're training a deep neural net. And then we have this machine learning algorithm for fast, uh, uh, fast inference mode. Um, and the reason, uh, the, the main uh, advantage here is that uh, the simulations can be very expensive. And so for the company to run these simulations over and over again uh, can be very costly and, and, and time consuming. Whereas the uh, inference model can be run uh, pretty much on, uh, uh, on site in the production facility on something like a gaming laptop. Uh, and when I say gaming laptop, that's something with a good GPU, a, a graphics uh, processing unit in there. Uh, now, we can uh, improve the, the uh, simulation uh, um, cost by doing intelligent sampling and speculative sampling. And uh, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, um, very similar to the active learning uh, that we, uh, was discussed earlier. And um, again, uh, another concept that we've uh, uh, hit, up, hit upon today is uh, uh, design of experiments. And the idea here is that we want to um, uh, set up a design of experiments that uh, can cover the design space efficiently. So the design space might uh, be a high dimension, uh, 10 dimensional, for instance, or depending on how many knobs say, uh, the, the, the system, ha uh, the, the pilot, the plant has to control its process. Um, and when we do certain designs like this box Bacon design, we can, we can rotate it to, co to, to cover existing data. So they might, uh, often these companies have a, a, a curated data set, and so we can figure out how we can leverage those <clears throat> and then run the additional run, uh, runs uh, to cover the, uh, the design space efficiently. And so, and we also want to make sure that we're uh, avoiding uh, certain corner points that are not physical. So uh, a lot of times the corner points, like where, where, where all the uh, control parameters are at the max or the min, are actually not a, a, a not a viable solution. So we want to uh, carefully avoid those um, with uh, with the design of experiments. And again, uh, here's an active learning example. We have this system uh, called Merlin that we run on our high performance computing. Um, what what it does is it allows for these uh, agents to run, and you can see. Um, uh, this diagram shows these agents running these different simulations 
and uh, Agent 1 might be in this uh, region of design space that uh, I'm colored gold, and uh, Agent 2 might be in this part of the design space where I've colored blue, and, um, and, and they run on, they, they, they have an idea of a model. They have a, a prior um, model that they're running on. And this is seeded from doing an initial design of experiments and, and coming up with a, a basic model. Um, and so they, if, if uh, Agent 1, for instance, is in this area um, and the simulation is agreeing with what the, uh, uh, the model is, then it's green. And then it might go over, uh, might stop in the middle of that simulation uh, and actually uh, continue in a different area in this blue region. And that saves, uh, that saves computational res resources <clears throat> so we can do more simulations. Uh, and so this is, uh, um, uh, this, is uh, this active learning algorithm that we call speculative sampling. So now it's coming over to this area that's uh, in this blue region where maybe the, the, the agent here has uh, compared its, uh, its simulation with model A and it's not doing so well. That's where the, the, red, the, the, the red dot is. At some point they, they come and they, uh, they publish their data. They're constantly publishing their data, but a, a new model is published, a model B, and then they can go on and, and uh, continue. Now there is this idea of explore voice versus exploit that we uh, uh, leverage. And in some cases, the, uh, uh, the, the model might actually agree with the simulation. Uh, and so instead of having this agent move off to a different area, it might com uh, complete the simulation in order to compare it, to gather more information. Uh, is our, um, is our uh, sim uh, speculative sampling algorithm doing well or not? And so we can continue on in, in, this, in this fashion. With transfer learning, we are actually taking uh, data from the, uh, from the plants and elevating the, the physics-based model that's already been learned to, uh, to actually uh, more uh, mimic the, uh, the uh, plant data better. Now, sometimes these, uh, these plants are well instrumented and they're, they're generating tons and tons of data, but they're not efficiently um, exploring the design space. So the data is actually lacking in some, in some respects. We can run the simulations all over the design space because it's, it's a lot cheaper. We don't have to worry about damaging equipment. Um, and so uh, it's better to generate the, the physics with the simulation and then adjust it um, with, uh, with this uh, transfer learning mechanism to, to mimic the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the experimental or plant data. And to do this, you take the deep neural net and you just, you freeze all but uh, some of the last layers and then you retrain on the experimental data. And since the experimental data is, is, uh, is sparse, uh, you, you actually have fewer weights to train. So this is a better way of, of doing that. And then you can have a retrained elevated model that uh, incorporates the physics and the, the true uh, production data, the true ground truth. And so this, this approach, um, uh, again, we're calling it scientific machine learning. Uh, we we uh, incorporate design of experiments, um, lots of uh, simulations. In this case, I'm showing some CFD simulations. Uh, there's, a, there's a curation of the data. And then we provide it, uh, 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 use this data to train a neural network. And the, the a typical approach that I like to use is to use the autoencoder. So the autoencoder, you can see, um, will take the, the phase space, the, the state space of the data. This is the um, temperature distribution over all the, over, over all the space, the, the velocities, the components of the velocities, the, the uh, uh, molar fractions of uh, materials, whatever is um, used to represent the state of the system. And it learns how to replicate itself <clears throat> but the information has to go through a bottleneck, and that's, that's this Z layer right here. Uh, this is actually a way of reducing into a, um, a lower dimensional space. Uh, this is akin to like a principal component analysis where you have these principal components. But with this uh, uh, autoencoder, it's, it's like a, a nonlinear uh, PCA. So once we have this well-trained, <clears throat> we can uh, 
project it projects out and replicates the the state space accurately within within a certain tolerance we can uh, we can train the uh, uh, the uh, a new data set and this new data set can be the control parameters and maybe some design parameters and we can tr train that to correlate with a, a point in the in in the uh, latent space in this uh, in this reduced dimensional space. And this can be done uh, with far fewer data points at this point. Uh, the advantage here <clears throat> is that we get the projection out to the uh, state, state space from over here for free. So we bring this over and now we can correlate the design space and, and the control space to the, to the state space of the simulation. And so <clears throat> the main, main, main points that we're, we're capturing here is that these neural nets can um, can learn these to predict these very complex uh, processes. Um, uh, simulations can provide the training data. That's a that's a key point here, and then we can take these uh, physical experiments or this production uh, data and integrate it into a uh, into a better uh, predictor model. And so we have these tools and resources like the Merlin uh, system, and that's actually open source. Um, uh, we we've used that for our um, at the national lab for our national ignition facility. So we, we have simulations of, of this inertial confinement fusion, and we've used that to elevate, uh, to, to train this, this, uh, this data and in, in, uh, these uh, deep neural nets and used our uh, data from our national ignition facility. Uh, we're, we're doing uh, target uh, fusion uh, physics. And um, that's where the, the, the Merlin system has been developed. And now it's open source for other folks to use. Uh, on their um, on their uh, uh, high performance computing systems, <clears throat> so the impact of this uh, of, of these uh, uh, programs is to uh, re uh, is that these reduced order models actually can run much much faster. Um, I didn't mention that in the glass simulation, those those uh, those simulations are very complex. Uh, they they're multi species, uh, uh, multi phase. Um, there's uh, issues that the, the, the energy transfer is um, speed of light because the uh, glass is transparent to the, to, the, um, uh, to the material. But then there's the molten flow, which is very slow. So you have speed of sound issues, a very stiff problem. It can take several days to actually run those to completion. Um, when the, uh, the, the production uh, was, ha it was having problems, they would have to launch four simulations uh, on their local cluster they would get the data back in four or five days, um, and then they would have to um, reset the the uh, the, the uh, production uh, from their best guess of those four, four simulations. Run it for a few days. Meanwhile, all this all this uh, molten glass was actually uh, the, the the had a lot uh, with uh, lots of flaws. Would have to be uh, taken out of the uh, um, uh, out of the uh, the end of the. Uh, out of the end of the uh, system and and recycled. So this was a, a big a big waste of uh, production. Um, the data integration uh, can actually um, uh, make the most out of the sensor data that uh, is used in these production facilities, and we use uncertainty quantification to um, um, to help figure out where the best bang for the buck is. How can you get the the information that uh, is the most useful? Is it more simulations? Is it better instrumentation? Uh, is it more physical runs? So we can uh, we can help with all this uh, with this with this program. Um, so so these project impacts that we've uh, uh, helped on these different projects uh, for the uh, for the uh, glass companies we've sa saved about two weeks of production per per for, uh, furnace, and if we extrapolate that to the uh, U.S. glass industry, that saves about two and a half tera BTUs of energy uh, and avoids about 130,000 uh, metric tons of CO2 emissions. Uh, for, the, uh, for the aluminum, uh, for, uh, aluminum companies, uh, we, uh, by uh, their, estimate, their es estimation of how, uh, how much they're saving is about $60 million a year if they can reduce half these scraps from their uh, casting facility. And they, they estimate that uh, the U.S. primary casting could save about uh, $365 million a year if by reducing 50% of their, um, their scrap waste. Um, we're also helping companies like Vast Power Systems 
uh, they are actually uh, generating um, uh, uh, power using these gas turbines that um, are on, on the ground and using water to cool them, but they're figuring out how to put the water, inject the water in order to reduce the uh, ni uh, 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 nitrate uh, emissions. Uh, we're also working with the steel industry, AK Steel, ArcelorMetal, uh, and their estimate is that, that they could save around uh, um, uh, three petajoules of energy or about uh, uh, $30 million a year uh, by reducing some of their, their, their issues with um, bad, bad casting uh, formations. <clears throat> uh, and so um, I, I think I've ended a little early, but uh, I guess we could start the, the Q&A uh, uh, session um, as, uh, at some point. And uh, I, I'd like to uh, actually do a little uh, advertisement for our manufacturing day, actually, before we, we get to there. Um, so in the, in the United States, we have this long time honored tradition ever since 2019. Uh, we, have, uh, we celebrate uh, Manufacturing Day on the first Friday of October. And so we are doing uh, uh, a lot of talks and I will actually be, uh, be presenting uh, some of my work there. And you can also, uh, also sign up and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with the speakers. <clears throat> and to register, you go to HBC for Manufacturing dot LLNL dot gov and I would also welcome you to uh, to uh, uh, join link in with me on LinkedIn um, and uh, at that point I will uh, end my uh, in my talk thank you very much thank you um, I think yes now we we are in, enter to the Q and A session, and um, I think I will, I will facilitate it, this this session. So, um, if anyone has any questions, please uh, leave your question in in the chat box or Q and A box, and then we will pick up your question for for the panel to 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 answer. And uh, let me look at. The... So are there any questions from, from the panelists uh, that we will uh, want to, to, to start asking uh, the, the speaker here? Uh, so I have a question for uh, Professor Shua. Sure. About yeah. the active learning um, mm -hmm. algorithm. So um, you do an explore versus exploit, and that's a very interesting. And, and, and you say that you do a trade-off, and mm -hmm. I'm wondering, uh, what is that, how, how is that trade-off determined and how is that different from just saying, I'm going to go um, um, find um, the areas that uh, have the greatest uncertainty or I'm going to go uh, search the areas that have the greatest uh, optimal value. It looks like, uh, it sounds like you do a trade-off to uh, mitigate the uncertainty and search for, an, uh, for optimal at the same time. All oh, right, right. Okay, so let me share my my screen. Yes, yes, please. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so what we did is uh, uh, we know that exploration we want to find the the data points or the experiment with the largest uncertainty, and for explore, exploitation we just believe in the predictions, we just choose the, the, the best predicted value. So, but in reality, reality, we don't know whether the model is good or not. So we can do like uh, several explorations and then do some, some exploitation. But uh, we won't do it at uh, the same time, we do the balance trade off. So we would like to de define a utility, utility function to which both related to the uncertainty and related to the to the predicted value. So we use such kind of a utility function to rank the, the all the possibilities and we select the the one with the highest score with respect to the utility function. So how this is this slide shows one way to design 
define the utility function. So, so we we actually calculate the shaded area. That is the possibility to improve, to have the better value if we do the experiment, the probability. Then what times the probability with respect to the, the improvement i, the i we define here is the max, maximum value between the y mi minus best so far and the zero. If the predicted value is below, below the best so far, we consider it is zero. If it is higher than it's y minus f max. So that is the improvement. We times the probability with the improvement and do the integration, then we get the expected improvement of the property. So this is the utility function we use. This utility function is both related with the predicted value. If the predicted value is high, we have higher EI, expected improvement. And it's also related with the uncertainty. If the, if the sigma here, the, the, the standard deviation is high, is large, then the expected improvement is also large. So by defining such kind of a utility function, we can do some balance trade-off between the exploitation and exploration. This is what we did. Yeah. Yes. It's actually, um, this is the, the, the same question as, as, as Professor Tong here to, to oh, yeah. ask you, would, like, would you like to comment on how to balance the exploitation and exploration? Okay. Okay, yeah, this is just one way to to do, and the the simplest way is just to, just to add the the predicted value with the standard deviation. So, put the two values together, then so th this utility function we call it UCB, sure. which is balance, which will balance exploitation and exploration. I don't know whether this is. Uh, okay for you. Yes. yes. Great. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Great. Th thanks. Thanks. We can as well. Um. Uh. In 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 the chat box here, we have another question, probably to 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 Enzo. Um. Compare with the casting process for the welding application. Is that possible to predict the microstructure evolution and predict the weld defect using the machine learning? I'll, I'll probably open to all panelists here. If he's not indicate who we're going to ask. So, uh, which question is? Uh, 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 yes, for welding application, is that possible to predict? the microstructure evolution and predict the well defect using machine learning, I mean, compare with casting process? Well, I guess it's possible how accurate it is. I'm, I'm not sure, yeah. Um, welding is a kind of like, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure, yes. I, I think probably is, is, I'm not the best person to answer this question. Probably. Yes, are there any, anyone in, in the, in, in the panelists has anything to add, please, please do so. Otherwise, I will go to the specific question to you, Enzo. Ah, there's someone asking, could you please elaborate a bit more on the combined effect of cooling rate and the cooling on new creation? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can show your slide yeah, if you yeah, want. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so... A second. So I think Latin effect of cooling rate is uh, is interesting because uh, uh, what what is known and is actually effectively known by theory and by experiment is that in, in any casting, if you increase the cooling rate, you ended up with a grain size that is smaller. That means that you've got more nucleation. Uh, that's what is actually what we observe in our in our data as well, and that would be concerning if it wasn't. So, uh, sorry. 
So like these data show like when you increase the cooling rate, uh, the crystal yes. formation rate increased, right? So that, that's actually yes. The correlation is that we saw that when you start to vary the solid content as well, uh, the effect of cooling rate, uh, sorry, the effect of solute content uh, is correlated to which cooling rate you're using. In other words, when you, when you don't have, when you are cooling very slow, essentially increasing your solute content doesn't really affect the, 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 the crystal formation rate. Well, when you start to increase the cooling rate, uh, the, the effect of solute is more is more uh, is more evident, right? And uh, I f we believe that essentially all of this is related to essentially this little explanation here, and and is actually uh, uh, related to the fact of how the undercool zone is developing. So the undercool zone is essentially how much driving force there is in the liquid that is not yet solid, right? So the undercooling uh, drive both the growth of the grain and, and the nucleation of, of, mm. the, of the grains, right? So there is a balance between them, like, uh, and depend of how much, we call it solute suppression. So while, when you've got a mixture of solid and liquid, like so some of the solid, when is it forming, is essentially, it's essentially growing, but in, in growing is actually ejecting solute. In this case, is the blue, right? In an alloy that sure. is more richer in solute, essentially this blue area is, 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 is for the same solid fraction is higher than in when you've got less solute. And the effect of it is essentially that it, you suppress more of the easy nucleation to actually achieve essentially nucleation a higher undercooling. But the size distribution of the nuclei in the liquid is not normal, right? And because of this reason, essentially, if you if you kill the the the, the potent nuclei, which are not very very diffuse, you basically are able to to activate more nuclei, right here. That's the effect of solute. The cooling rate instead is not is not shown in this data, but essentially it has an effect on the shape of the, of the diffusion uh, zone, right? And it basically can be explained with a similar argument. When you increase the cooling rate, you essentially narrow the diffusion length and you increase this effect. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much uh, for, for your clear answer on this. Uh, I think there's some thing we, we have today uh, we more, professor we have more questions in the chat. yeah we have more questions yes um just just to answer to the previous question on welding application professor i think we have professor harry Badesia here he said yes the microstructure and property of the well has been extensively treated using machine learning a lot of literature i think uh, answer to uh, someone question i think yes sure um there's another question to to victor to wick on uh, he uh, I think from Professor Tong he he's, uh, he asked you do you mention using the auto encoder to learn efficient data coding mm -hmm. will this have any effect on accuracy? Um, so so it does it does uh, to some degree but we're able to get a, a pretty good representation um, of the of the state space on both sides uh, through the auto encoder. And one of the neat examples, so first of all, we, we use lots of simulation. So we have lots of data from here. In addition, we find, uh, we have uh, some ways to use uh, um, data augmentation. And this is actually the key thing. Um, with data augmentation, uh, with images, they would, they, they would take the image and they would skew them or they would uh, rescale them or, or translate them. Uh, with simulation, uh, we, we have a way of, of doing an, an analogous uh, method uh, to get uh, to augment the, the data. So we have lots of data to train these uh, uh, this auto encoder that has lots of weights. But another mm -hmm. advantage is with this latent space, we can actually map out. We can uh, reduce it in a way that we can map out uh, uh, easier where the better locations in this uh, latent space are for production. Uh, we can actually map. Uh, uh, scalars such as uh, uh, pr production flaws into this latent space pretty well. And then that is a, a, 
a, a, a background or a, a start for a, a control algorithm. So we can actually consider um, where you are uh, in this latent space and what is the better direction in this latent space uh, to, uh, to get to a, a region that has a fewer flaws um, based on the simulations or based on the production data. Cool. And, and so this is, a, um, we, we're, we're actually starting to explore a new sure. uh, control algorithm on this. Great, I'm just following on what uh, you have uh, said earlier. And uh, you said you have a two, you said two set of dates, experimental and a simulation dates. I right. use this to training and validation uh, your, your models. Um, uh, if you have different combination of uh, an experimental data with simulation data, will this affect this sort of training uh, efficiency or, or, or accuracy? Yeah. Um, so, so the uh, the transfer learning is actually done on, on a second stage. It's not actually done on the um, autoencoder itself. Mm -hmm. um, we're able to to um, I, I, one of the main things that we're we're doing is mapping the uh, the, the um, uh, production data into this latent space, and that that turns out to be very useful in in itself. Um, the uh, um, transfer learning itself, we 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 can actually get pretty good replication, uh, somewhere on the order of, um, you know, the high 90 uh, uh, R squares. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it's good enough for, um, for these production uh, uh, sim simulations or these production uh, situations. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Actually, I have a question probably to, to, to everyone, uh, to, to the panelists here. So we do, you, you present me, for example, we uh, present the, I mean, CFD simulation for, I think, fusion, nuclear fusion application, right? Are there any other um, materials or, or manufacturing uh, case study that, that we apply AI and successfully uh, implemented in, in the real application? Do you have any comment? I mean, probably apply to new material discovery as well from Professor Xie and then Enzo for new uh, certification and, 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 and we, you have any other case study that successfully implement this, this, this type of, 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 of AI, application of AI in, in the real yes. application. So let, let me, uh, I, I'm actually using this on some COVID-19 um, um, antibody studies. Sure, and so, antibody, yeah. okay. Yeah, okay. so the antibody, wow. uh, what, what we're studying, uh, is, is perturbations, mutations on an antibody uh, uh, that this antibody was effective for SARS-1 and we're mu mu doing mutations for this uh, 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 SARS-2 COVID. And sure. we are, um, if you look at all the possible mutations within that we're interested in, uh, the number of perturbations, uh, combinations that we, we, we can mm. study is about Avogadro's number. So it's a very large uh, mm. exploration space. What we've done is we've uh, reduced this uh, to uh, represent uh, to these representative features of the uh, antibodies, which is more of a 58 dimensional, uh, well, actually it's more like an 86 dimensional space, but uh, some of the sure. studies we do are a little bit lower. And we're able to reduce this into a, into a latent space and actually um, look for regions that uh, have a high change in energy, change in free energy. So you want to minimize the change in free energy between the uh, the antibodies and the antigens, and so um, um, we're actually using the same method for for that, which is very different because it's it's a discrete space as opposed to these continuous spaces from these CFDs uh, uh, studies. So it um, yes. this method is 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 starting mm -hmm. to show pretty good generalization. Mm -hmm. Sure. Are, are there any application closer to the metal or metal metallurgy? Mm -hmm. Uh, application, for example, additive manufacturing is as the, and I, I, I'm sure that there's a program in Lowlands Dual Wall working on that. Is that FI? We, we are studying uh, metal additive manufacturing quite a bit. We published, uh, uh, we, we did some work and we, uh, we actually pu published a, a seminal paper on, on this keyhole effect uh, from actually, uh, we did the design of experiments and found regions where um, sure. you can actually get uh, this keyholing. Um, we have not applied the uh, sim, uh, these uh, sim, uh, AI methods to that yet. Uh, sure. Although there's another research that's doing uh, researcher doing really good uh, uh, AI machine learning um, 
uh, production of these uh, additive manufacturing of polymers. So a um, polymer, okay. Yeah. So we're cool. we're we'll probably be doing a, a looking into the metal additive, additive manufacturing uh, pretty soon. We we have a really nice lab uh, now for for doing that and and doing um, uh, additive manufacturing of, of reactive materials like titanium and aluminum mm. um, and other materials like that. Yes, I'm also working oh. with the uh, steel industry on on the ro cold rolling process. Cold so rolling process. Yes. Yeah, I don't have that yet. And then we have uh, another steel industry um, uh, partner looking at uh, casting defects. So those are still, uh, we're still in the simulation process uh, of, the, of, of those. And then we'll do the ma machine learning. I probably have something to report uh, in about six months. Of course, probably we next time. We are doing uh, something uh, similar in predicting casting defects and also predicting mechanic properties of steers. And then, uh, for example, look in property prediction, and then if you look into strength and the conductivity, and then probably uh, our value can get to higher 90, 97, 98, or your 99. And, but, and then if you look at this uh, 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 fracture toughness data, and yeah. they are quite low, looking to probably 80 or 90, low, very low 90s. Um, yeah, we. I'm not very sure, but we probably suspect uh, a, a, a couple of reasons. I'm not sure what I want to discuss. You now, probably this is, uh, we said this is kind of a, 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 a stochastic effect because uh, fresh toughness depends probably on the largest, largest defect in, in, in the materials. And then you, uh, this kind of a small possibility to occur. And then you either need a larger data or we have not found something uh, which is a key data in, our, in, in the input yet. Yeah, in the input mainly we essentially use chemistry and processing and we ignore this uh, in, uh, the essential part of this microstructure of this. Uh, uh, you have chemistry, you have processing, and then you predict the pro properties. Yeah, uh, we may have something which is missing uh, in, the, in, the, in the, we try very hard. We have large set of data, we work working with the industry uh, to look into because I have been recorded for a long time. Mm. So, uh, so, uh, so, uh, so for the mechanic product prediction, uh, some of them we said, well, we're quite confident to do it. But for uh, 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 fresh new compound, we have less confident, uh, uh, less confident in, in uh, comparing uh, with the other property prediction. Mm. Mm. Yes. Um. We're using the software. Um, it, there's a public uh, domain software uh, called Hot Strip Strip Mill uh, Model uh, HSMM, and so we're um, we're actually using that uh, to generate, um, you know, tens of thousands of simulation points on our on our uh, on our machine. Mm -hmm. um, it it is designed to run on a PC uh, in the in the plant, and it's very very good at predicting. Uh, the microstructure at the head, tail, and, and midsection of, of, a, of a roll. Uh, we're looking to expand the prediction to do in real time uh, hundreds of, of points along the strip. And so again, and even through the depth, trying to figure out what the uh, uh, microstructure should be within that uh, uh, that uh, rolled steel. Yeah. Okay, you, you've got a microstructure into play. And before, uh, okay, this is something we have not tried yet. We, we use input mainly the chemistry and processing at very low. And this yeah. is what happened in the industry, the kind of steel making industry. They know this, they don't know the microstructure, anything like that. No. Mm. I think probably one of the or last question to Professor Xue. Uh, you, you mentioned that you have a case study in chip memory alloy, nickel titanium, mm. right? You know. Are there any more complicated system that tertiary or quarterly or high entropy alloy that you apply your method to, 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 to look into the uh, new material discovery or not? We, we, you have, have any example? Yeah. yeah, we have applied these similar methods, approaches, the balance sheet off to, to explore, to, to try to find the high entropy alloys with higher hardness. So, oh. and we also do some active learning 
methods to do the classification of the high entropy alloys to yes. to classify the the BCC FCC and the dual phase high entropy alloys. Okay. And we also do some some optimization of the pro processing conditions to the magnesium alloys. We we do some multi objective optimization. We have two goals to to achieve higher strength and uh, higher ductility. You know, they are exclusive, but uh, we want to use the multi-objective op multi optimizations combined with these optimization algorithms, the, the, the yes. trade-off uh, algorithms to quickly find the better balance trade-off between them and yeah. using the two-step aging process in the, in the magnesium alloys. Yeah. That's that's the, the that's what yeah, we very interesting. Want. So this is a work in in progress at the moment. It's not published yet, or you you working so you on have, this now? Now we have published it. We already published sure. them, and now we are working on. You know, just now the the processing is just a, just a, in yeah. one stage in the in the heat treatment stage. Now we want sure. to expand it to the whole process and see whether okay. this method can help. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. So I think I will hand over back to, to Jenny now to, to probably wrap up the, the session for today. Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, so I'd just like to thank all our speakers again um, and our virtual audience for your um, attention and contributions for the, of those questions. Um, so next week we have the fourth in this series of webinars. Um, so it's next Wednesday the 30th, I believe at 12.30 UK time. Are we back to the same time? Um, uh, seminar start at one one. Oh, uh, one. Sorry, <laughs> yes. So one o'clock. Sorry, <laughs> next Wednesday the thirtieth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, so the focus will be on the industry response to the digitization and AI initiative, um, and it will include some real um, project examples. So a more sort of applied um, seminar session um, next week. So with that, I hope to see lots of you next week. And thank you very much for um, attending this week.